Take your Bible today and turn to the book of Ruth chapter 4. I appreciate Brother Tony taking over while we were away on our tour to the Holy Land in Switzerland. He did a good job. He did some good preaching. And Brother Lawrence Griffith also did some good preaching. And I appreciate it so very much. I appreciate your faithfulness in being here last Sunday. I understand you had a good day. And we appreciate you in the radio listening audience. Tuning in last Sunday as well as you that are tuning in today. May God bless you. Now turn to Ruth chapter 4. We bring in message number 11 on the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 4, message 11. Now the singing and the message today will be on cassette tape. These tape will be available for $3 each. And the $3 is used to help defray our radio expense. Now my mailing address is Virgil Edwards. P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you're tuned to this station where you're now listening, you get the daily broadcast each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday. And I hope if you're not getting that daily broadcast, you will pick it up beginning on tomorrow at 12 and listen to our daily broadcast. We have some 272 tapes. Now, tape today is number 272. And we have a list of some 260 of these tapes. We'll be glad to send you the list. And you can select the ones that you'd like to select and write in for them. We have messages on prophecy. We have messages, of course, on the rapture, the coming of the Lord. We have messages on great doctrines such as the Holy Spirit and the blood of Christ and various other important factors you find in the Word of God, which you know the entire Bible is important as far as that. But you can select the messages you want to get. Now, we will you be surprised at some of the topics, and I think the messages will be helpful. And if you get the list, you can write in and get them by title or by number. So I hope you have that Bible open now at Ruth chapter 4. We visited the land uh, last week of uh, the uh, shepherd's field where Ruth and, of course, met Boaz, where Boaz owned the portion of this land. And we saw this beautiful valley watched again just outside of the beautiful city of uh, Bethlehem. We visited the tomb of Christ, the, the uh, stable of Christ, rather, where that he was born. And we visited the church there built over that particular uh, site, the oldest church, I suppose, in the world. And then, of course, we visited Mount Calvary and the garden tomb and many wonderful places. Took a ride on the Sea of Galilee, as usual. Saw the tomb of David, saw the tomb of Samuel. Saw the Dead Sea and many wonderful historical places in the land of Israel. Then after leaving Israel, we went into Switzerland and spent two nights and a day there, almost two days. And we saw so many wonderful sights in Switzerland. We saw the church where John Calvin preached and where John Knox preached. And I stood in the pulpit of the church where John um, Calvin preached. Last Sunday, I preached in the first Bible Baptist Church in the city of Jerusalem. I was preaching there last Sunday while you were having your services here. I preached on Sunday night and about the time you were having your Sunday school here last Sunday. So I enjoyed the service there in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the pastor was an Arab and he had people that spoke the Arab language. And, of course, he had to interpret uh, what I said. Of course, we had our tour group there. And uh, as I spoke, he interpreted the message to his people there in Arabic. So we had a wonderful time on our tour. And we thank God that he brought us safely back. And thank God for your prayers and your faithfulness in coming right on and serving God while we were away. Now, in the book of Ruth, chapter 4... I want to read a few verses and bring message number 11. Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. 
unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit you down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, uh, Naomi, that is, that is come out of the country of Moab, set at a portion of ground, portion of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou redeem it, redeem it. But if thou will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it besides thee. And I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. You notice the word redeem is mentioned some five times here in this verse. And I, I dwelt two weeks ago today mainly on that line of thought. I read the same scripture I'm reading today. Let's look at verse 5. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi? Thou might, must buy it also of the roof of the Moabites, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead unto his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now this was the manner in former times in Israel, concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. Now the Lord willing, next Sunday morning, I'll read the remainder of this chapter and I'll bring message number 12 then, the Lord willing, on this great book. This is a wonderful book, one of the greatest love stories embedded in the Word of God. And it's a book that you need to read it over and over again because of the typology, the great uh, symbolic meanings and the pragmatic meanings you find here in this wonderful portion of God's Word. Now we saw here in this great book in chapters 1 and 2 we find grace sought. In chapter 3 we saw rest sought. In chapter 4 we see the glorification of all of this. And so we left off last Sunday a week ago talking about the redeeming of this land. Now remember Elimelech and Naomi had pawned their land, so to speak. We might use that word. I think it would be fitting that you might better understand what happened. And they went down into the country of Moab. Now according to the law in the Old Testament, when a person loses his property, he has to wait 50 years before he can get it back. Every 50th year they had the jubilee. So we'd have to wait until a time of jubilee to get it back. And then on that 50th year they could get their land back. But in the meantime, if they had a kinsman that was wealthy enough and willing to do so, he could buy the land back. Now remember Elimelech and Naomi had been gone about 9 or 10 years. And they came back, as she did rather, with her two, one of the daughter-in-laws back to the beautiful place of Bethlehem. Because she had buried her husband and two sons, and we find that Ophir had turned back to her people and her God, went into oblivion, and you hear no more about Ophir, but you do hear much about Ruth. Now, Ruth is a beautiful type of the church. Naomi is a type of Israel. You must keep that in mind to understand this beautiful book. Not only is Ruth a type of the church, but she's a type of a newly born person that's just received Christ and come into the family of God. Now when she arrived, arrived back on the scene, uh, she went into the field immediately to labor, and she labored in a field belonging to Boaz. Now Boaz was a near kinsman of Elimelech and Naomi, and he was a rich man, a very wealthy man, of course, uh, in the lands and cattle and so forth. And uh, he had to be a wealthy man, a willing man, and a near kinsman to be able to buy back what these people had lost. Now that's the transaction here. Now if you remember in there at the thrashing floor about the conversation, and then they found out that this man Boaz loved Ruth and wanted to marry her. And so he promised her that he would marry her. But as they were talking about this matter, then they happened to think there was a near a kinsman, a person 
a little closer kin than this particular man, Boaz, and he had to have the first opportunity to marry Ruth and buy back the land. But we find in chapter 4 now, they had discussed this matter, and Boaz had said, there is a near kinsman. We've got to deal with this matter. Now, he has the first choice, and we'll meet at the gate tomorrow, and then we'll transact this business. So the next day, Boaz goes down. He takes initiative. He was probably a leader there in Bethlehem. He was quite wealthy. And he goes down to the gate. That's where they transact the business, did in those days, at the gate. And so he goes down the gate, and then he calls in ten elders. Now these ten elders represents the law, the Ten Commandments. He calls them in. And while he's calling them in, lo and behold, here comes a man that's a near of kin to Limelech and then Naomi than Boaz is. He's standing in the way. Now Boaz can't buy the land back, and he cannot marry Ruth, until this man is dealt with. And he comes on the scene. And Boaz said. Hold such a one. Sit down here. And he sat down. He said now. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about buying back the land. That Elimelech and Naomi had lost. And then. Uh, I'm going to give you first chance. Because you're near of kin. Would you be willing to buy this land back? He said yes. I, I'd be willing to buy it back. And he said now wait a minute. That's not all. Whoever buys this land back has to take Ruth and marry her and let her become his wife. Are you willing to do that? Oh, he said, no, I can't do that. If I marry that woman, she would mar my own inheritance. No doubt he had a wife and children, and he didn't want to get involved with another wife. And he said, she would mar my inheritance. Now, this unnameable person, this person that's near of kin, the Bible doesn't give his name, He's a type of the flesh of the Adamic nature. Now we have the ten elders, a type of the law. And then we have this man, a type of the flesh, the Adamic nature. Now all of these things stand in the way in people getting saved or being married to Christ. Now this has to be dealt with. He said, all right now, if you're willing then to give up what you're entitled to then, of course, you'll have to take your shoe off and, and we'll transact business. So he took his shoe off and handed that to Boaz. And that meant that I'm stepping out of the way. So now you can redeem Ruth and you can redeem the lamb. Now, let me say this in dealing with this, that the law cannot save. The ten elders here could not buy back this land. The law cannot save. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. If you follow the law of God, it will point you to Jesus Christ, but it cannot save you. Now, you might observe the Ten Commandments. You might keep them. I thank you keeping them. And say, well, I have kept the commandments. I have kept the Ten Commandments. You still die and go to hell if you don't get saved. Now, you might to live a good moral life. And you might say, well, I brought the old man under subjection. I lived a good, clean, moral life. And therefore, I've overcome the flesh. And therefore, I'm a good, clean, honest individual. You might do that. You would still die and go to hell. You've got to have something done about your past sins. It must be redemption. Now, Jesus Christ is the one that paid that redemptive blood. Now, we're saved by his precious blood, by his death on Calvary. And he redeems the human race back to him. And, of course, when he does that, you belong to him. I'm reminded... Of the story of the little boy. They wanted very much to buy him a little puppy dog. And uh, he uh, saw in the paper. Where a man had some little puppies for sale. And he had saved up his money. And he saved up six dollars. He said oh I've been waiting a long time. To go and buy me a little dog. And so he made his way to the man's house. And when he arrived on the scene. He said I saw in the paper. Where you had some little puppies for sale. He said yes son. I have them here, carried them in. They're beautiful little fellows. And he said, yes, I have them for sale. Little boy said, sir, I want to buy one. How much are they? Oh, he said, they are $10 each. Oh, he said, I'm sorry, I don't have the $6. The man said, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, young man, but I'll have to have $10 for these little puppies. 
And then there was a little crippled one over there. He said, oh, by the way, here, I said, there's one in this litter that's a little crippled puppy. He can't very well walk on one of his little legs. And I'll tell you what I'll do, son. If you want the little crippled one, you can have it for six dollars. Little boy looked down at his little puppy. Little puppy looked up at him. And he said, sir, I'll take it. He gave the man six dollars. And the man placed the little crippled puppy in his arms. And he went out the door and down the road. And as he traveled down the road, that little puppy would look up at him and lick his face. And, and let the little boy know how much he loved him and appreciated him. And that little boy hugged him to his bosom. He said to him, he said, I'm telling you, you may be crippled. But there's one thing about it. I love you. I have bought you with my six dollars. You belong to me. And I don't care if you are crippled. You're mine. I love you just as much. And he hugged the little dog to his bosom. Beloved, I don't care how far you've gone in sin. You may have been a cursor, a gambler, a whoremonger, a harlot, a, a liquor drinker, or whatnot. When God saved you, you may have been wounded by the God of this world. You may follow the rest of your life a suffering because of your past sins. But if you belong to God, God loves you, your scars and all. God didn't love your sins, but God paid for your sins on Calvary. And that you need to realize. You may carry the scars with you to the grave, but God paid your sin debt on Calvary and redeemed you from all past sins. And you'll not have to answer God for them in the day of judgment. Now this man, boys, went to the gate and there they did business. Now Jesus suffered on the outside of the gate. That's where he did business. Now this past week we visited uh, the garden tomb and Calvary's, uh, Mount Calvary where Jesus was crucified. On the outside of the wall of Jerusalem there is that place called Calvary. It's not on the inside, it's on the outside of the Jerusalem wall. Now the Bible said here that Jesus suffered without the gate. On the outside of the city wall is where Jesus died. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Jesus did not die on the inside of that gate. Now our God carried us to a place they call uh, the tomb and uh, where he died and so forth, but that's not the place. That's on the inside of the gate. We went to the real place, uh, the Gordon's tomb and, and Mount Calvary, where Jesus paid this in it where he was buried. The other place is a place of tradition. There was a uh, planned out by man and surmised by some individual that that might be the spot, but that was on the inside. The Bible said that Jesus suffered on the outside of the gate, which he did, and paid for our sin debts on Calvary. Now we notice here that the ten men of the elders of the city uh, sat down. He said, sit down here. They sat down. Now the law must be kept. These ten elders must be here to witness this transaction. It could not be done without their presence. Now listen to me now and listen carefully unless you misunderstand what I'm saying. No man can go to heaven unless he keeps the ten commandments perfectly and in their completeness. Now wait a minute. No man can enter heaven unless it's reckoned to him that he has kept the Ten Commandments in all their fullness and their completeness. Now here's what happened. When Jesus came, no man was able to keep the law and go to heaven by doing so. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the only man that kept the Ten Commandments, all the commandments of the Old Testament, and kept them to their fullness, and fulfilled every one of them in their completeness, and pleased God the Father, and satisfied His Father. God the Father said, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus kept the Ten Commandments. Now follow me closely. When you come as a sinner, realize you cannot keep the law, or the ceremonial law, or the moral law to get you to heaven, but they have to be kept. But when you accept Jesus Christ, you accept them already having been kept in their fullness, and God gives you credit for them having been kept, but Jesus kept them for you. 
Are you following it? That's the only way you can make it in. And Jesus kept them for you and satisfied God the Father on your behalf that they have been kept in their completeness and you can go to heaven because of what he did for you on Calvary. Now you keep that in mind. These ten elders had to be here. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And Jesus kept that law in him is no sin. His conduct, in his uh, conduct, there is no sin. In his character, there was no sin. Talking about Jesus. In his cognates, they, he knew no sin. And the people here speaks the world at large. That is, there were the ten elders. That was the unknown man, unnamed man, type of the flesh, type of the damnic nature. And there were the other people around the gate watching the transaction. That's exactly what happened at Calvary. When Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible said they sat down and watched him there. The Bible says in Luke chapter 23 and verse 40, and all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which had done, smote their breast and returned. When Jesus Christ was crucified, there sat the people. There sat the lawyers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, all of that group, the sinners, all the people are watching Jesus as he died there on Mount Calvary. They watched him. Now around the city gate in Bethlehem sat all the people, the elders, the unnamed man, Boaz, Ruth, Naomi, Naomi representing Israel. There they were, watching the transaction there at the gate at Bethlehem. Yes, they watched what happened on Calvary. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid that sin debt. As I told you two weeks ago, that we had lost our righteous standing before God. The Bible said there's none good, no, not one. The Bible said we all turn unto our own way. God laid on him the sins of us all. And when Jesus Christ died on Calvary, he redeemed back everything we lost in Adam. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, God expelled him from that garden. He lost his righteous standing before God. He lost his righteous covering, his glory, the head with God in the garden. Lost it. Lost it completely. And when Adam fell, the entire human race fell in Adam. And from that time until now, every man that's been born into this world comes here born in sin. And when he grows up old enough, what we call the age of accountability for what he's doing, and realize he needs the Savior, he can be saved, redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Now he's safe until that time, but he can be redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now whenever Jesus died on the cross, he bought back everything we lost in Adam. Now when you get saved, God sees you in Christ as though you'd never failed in Adam. God sees you in Christ as though you'd never sinned. God sees you in Christ as though you never will sin. God sees us perfect in Jesus Christ because he satisfied God the Father in what he did. That's the only way you can get to heaven. The only way you can go to heaven is by being perfect. And that perfection is not in your own human efforts, good works, the deeds, or good morality. That perfection is in Christ. He is the perfect one. And when you're saved, you're baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God. And God sees you perfect in Jesus. God said, be also perfect. Now, when God looks down upon you, he sees a perfect individual in Christ. Now, in the Adamic flesh, we're not perfect. But we don't go to heaven over the Adamic flesh. We go to heaven by uh, the perfection of Jesus Christ, God's imputed righteousness that we have that's been imputed unto us the moment we're saved. So you don't go to heaven on what you do and don't do. You don't go to heaven on good works. You don't go to heaven on good morality. You don't go to heaven on human efforts or by keeping the law. You go to heaven upon His imputed righteousness Amen. that God imputes unto you the moment you're saved, born again, washed in His precious blood. If that's not happened to you, you're going straight to hell as a Martin to his going. No man can go to heaven 
without the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now this world today is wrecked in religion. Uh, Jerusalem, and I told them last Sunday night over there in the first of Bible Baptist Church in the city of Jerusalem, I said, Jerusalem is dead. Jerusalem has been killed spiritually. And that's true. You won't find a deader place in the world, spiritually speaking, than Jerusalem. Why? Religion has killed Jerusalem. Killed it as dead as it can be. In Jerusalem, they have the uh, three major religions. They have the Islamic religion. They have uh, uh, the Roman Catholicism religion. And then they have Judaism. Of course, they have a few Christian people around there, very few. Now, these three religions, without Jesus Christ, without God, without the Spirit of God, has killed that place as dead. You won't find a more deader place in the world than Jerusalem, spiritually speaking. That is, uh, people expect that to be a wonderful place where you can go and shout the victory. Not all. It's a dead place, religiously speaking, just as dead as it can be. Now there's some saved people, no doubt, around there. But religion has done it up and done it in. And so it's a place where those major religions have killed her as dead as she can be. And religion all over this world without God is as dead as it can be. And the world today is filled with religion. You go to India, they have religion. You go to China, they have religion. You go uh, uh, to the Middle East, they have religion. Anywhere you go today in the world, they have religion. But religion apart from the imputed rights of Jesus Christ is not worth a dime with a hole in it. There will be millions and millions of people in hell that were religious from the time they came into the world until they died. Religion will send you as straight to hell as you can go. Now what you need is a good dose of old time, old fashioned, Holy Ghost salvation. That makes the difference. When you get good salvation and God gives you that, it's a gift. Not something you earn or you have to work for or buy. It's something God gives you. When God gives you salvation, then of course you're in Christ. You're on the right track. You have the right kind. And that's the only kind that will get you to heaven. Amen. You better believe that. And so we find here that the near kinsman could not redeem it. And what the law could not do in it was weak through the flesh. God sent his own son likeness to sin. The flesh condemned sin in the flesh. The law couldn't do it. Romans chapter 8 verse 3. What the law could not do. Nothing wrong with the law. But the law couldn't lift man out of his sinful condition. Like a man he has a, a woman has a roast in the pot. And she's cooked that roast. Nothing wrong with the roast. And she has a tongs in which she can reach in and pull that roast out. But when she reaches in to pull it out, it begins to crumble and break to pieces. And she gets nothing. Nothing wrong with the law. But beloved, the law cannot lift you out of your sins. Only Jesus Christ can lift you out of your sins. And whenever you're lifted out of your sins by him... You have kept the law in him, and he kept it for you, and you need to realize that. And so the man takes off his shoe, he gives it to the other man, and he tells him, now uh, the, uh, the transaction can take place. Now Moses, when he was at the burning bush in the book of Exodus, had to take off his shoes. Now God said, Moses, you can't wear shoes to walk on my ground. You've got to do business with me and do what I tell you to do, and that he did. And so we find Boaz purchased the land. He bought it all. He bought the lamb. And he bought Ruth. And he, he married Ruth. And so did Jesus buy it all on Calvary. Jesus bought everything. All to him we owe. City left her crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Jesus bought the church. He bought what Adam lost. And so we find that Ruth planned for the marriage. And there the wedding took place. And then God gave them a wonderful son. Now the Lord went in next Sunday morning. We're going to look into that and just what it means. But we see here the grace of God. The marvelous, wonderful grace of God and what happened. We're going to point out to you next Sunday, the Lord willing, some of the great deeds and acts of grace that no doubt you'll be amazed at seeing 
in the Word of God. The wonderful, wonderful grace of God. And if you're saved, it's by God's marvelous grace that you're saved. Not by works lest any man should boast. The Bible tells you in the book of Ephesians that by grace through faith are you saved. That not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the only thing you can do as a lost sinner is to take your place before God as a sinner. Nothing you can do. You can't buy it. You can't work for it. You can't keep creeds, forms, and ceremonies for it. You just take your place humbly before God as a sinner. And you say, say Lord, I, I, I can't save myself. I can't blot out my past sins. Lord, I can't buy my way in. I'm not good enough to get to heaven. God, here I am. Just a lost sinner. I want to be saved. I'm sorry I've sinned against God. I want to be saved. I right now believe on Jesus with all my heart. I right now receive him into my heart by faith. I trust him now as my savior. I want to witness for him and serve him the rest of my days. When you do that, God blots out all your past sins. And God Almighty imputes on you his divine righteousness. And God sees you in Jesus Christ as though you'd never committed a sin in your life or ever will commit one. You're seen in Christ then and you're baptized that very moment into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. By one Spirit you're baptized into the body of Christ. And the Bible said the Holy Ghost seals you in the body of Christ and you're sealed on the day of redemption. And the redemption is the redemption of the body when that body is glorified. So if you're here today out in the radio listening audience and you're not saved, you ought to get saved. People are dying every day. People are going into hell every day. 250,000 people born in this world every day. And I just surmise maybe there's uh, 200,000 maybe somewhere uh, in that um, uh, neighborhood that die without, die most of them without God. It's pitiful. People live, die like they live. If you have 90% of the people today living for sin and Satan and self, you have 90% going to hell. God is not performing miracles in time of death in that respect. They're going down the broad road like they live and dying without God. You have a chance to be saved today. If you're not, if you're backsliding, you can come back to God. If you want to join this church, you may walk down this aisle, present yourself. We'll take over from there. Let us all stand with you, please. And we'll have a word of prayer. Give you a chance to come forward. Dear Father in heaven, I pray today you'll take the message and use it not only in the auditorium here, but out in the vast radio listening audience. God, as we give this invitation, I do pray that you'll have your way in every heart. In the name of Jesus, our precious Lord. Amen. Dave is playing for us on the instrument softly for just a moment or so. Are you saved? Would you like to get saved today? Have you been saved and broken fellowship with God? You'd like to come back into God's fold, back into fellowship, brother? If so, you may come. Are you here today and you'd like the North Side to be your home church and you want to come down and present yourself? as to become a member of this church, would you come? We'll accept you as we accept members. While we wait now, if there's any other reason you feel like you should come and I haven't mentioned, I want you to feel free to come. Would you do it? speaking I brought the message God laid on my heart it's up to you now to respond I'm giving you ample time to do that we're going in just a moment how about it 